Hi there, my name is Matt Buckley and I'll be reading scripture today. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 through 7, and chapter 9, verses 6 through 15. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to, of the, to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, as just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love that we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves the, a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, and their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed, and he will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous in every occasion, and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ, and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else, and in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the sur surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Well, good morning. How are you today? Hey, and how about you that are online? I want to say a great big welcome to you. So good to see you. Can I give you a question that you can start chatting about online uh, as we start? Here's the question, and it'll come into our sermon later on. Are you more of a saver or are you more of a spender? All right, that's a question just, you know, you can get online, start commenting, answering that question. Are you more of a saver or more of a spender? But for those of us uh, who are in-house or online, it's time to do our Kahoot quiz. And this morning it is a quiz, so it's a contest. We're going to have a winner. It's going to be exciting. And how do you get points? Go to kahoot.it with your smartphone or, or a laptop if you're at home or whatever. Get your smart device to kahoot.it. And here's the number for our quiz today, 627-0116. 627-0116. One, one, six. So I'll give you a few seconds just to get logged in there to kahoot.it, and we're doing a quiz. Again, it's a contest. You get uh, points for getting each question right, and then you get extra points if you answer more, get it right and you answer quickly. So uh, you can be smart, and you can be fast, and you might even win today, the quiz that we have. So, okay, one last time for that number, 627-0116. Six. All right. So, I'll just give you another second or two to chime in, and um, let's get started with our questions. Here's our first question today. Uh, if I dedicate my life to God's purposes, it's a what situation? So, uh, is it a win-lose? That's the red triangle. Or the blue uh, diamond is lose-lose. Yellow circle is win-win. And green square is lose win all right so those are our options this morning so if i and this is a quote from pastor Dacey's message a few weeks ago if i dedicate my life to god's purpose it's a blank situation so just chime in give us your answer and uh, we'll see if you got it right or wrong 
The answers are win-lose, lose-lose, win-win, or lose-win. What's the answer? Well, we're just going to find out. Well, okay. Well, 37 of you got it right. You said it's a win-win situation. And uh, uh, that was, you know, that was getting us started. That was more of a softball question. They're going to get harder as we go along. Let's jump to our next question. Okay. Our next question is, complete the quote from Pastor Kurt's sermon. Oh, these are all reviews, guys. If you're in a storm, fill up the sentence, let Jesus keep you warm. If you're in the storm, don't be lukewarm. If you're in a storm, call 911 to inform. If you're in a storm, make worship your norm. Which one is it? All right, so let me go through them again. The red triangle. If you're in a storm, let Jesus keep you warm. And then the blue diamond. If you're in a storm, don't be lukewarm. The yellow circle is... If you're in a storm, call 911 to inform. And then the red, or I mean, the, the last one is the green square. If you're in a storm, make worship your norm. Which one is the right answer? Okay, I think we've already got some results here. And it looks like most of you uh, picked make worship your norm, which is the right answer. All right, let's go to the next one. Here's our next question. Um, this is from Pastor Chris's message. This blank is not inept. It can pump the iron. But what, O oh blank, is that you deliver? Pastor Chris. So let me give it to you. Uh, this elbow is not inept, but it can pump the iron. But what, O oh big toe, is that you deliver? This eyebrow is not inept. But what, O oh appendix, is that you deliver? This bicep is not inept. But what, O oh, liver, is it that you deliver? And this hand is not inept, but what, but oh, foot, what is that you deliver? Okay, yes, Chris just made it as complicated as possible for us to get this right. Okay, so here we go. Oh, there's our results. Lots of you went with the hand and the foot, but it ended up being the bicep and the liver. And that was just a funny statement. He was tricking us, I remember that Sunday, by saying, you know, uh, this is a famous saying, but it's famous because he made it up. All right, so let's go to the next one. How are you doing so far? You got your scores showing up on your device? Okay, here we go. Next question, what was the coldest temperature Moose Jaw reached this past week with no wind chill? So minus 37.5 is the red triangle. Minus 39 is the blue diamond. Uh, the yellow circle is minus 38. And the green circle is minus too cold. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so there's your options. Again, the red one, 37.5. The blue, 39. The yellow is 38. And then the green is just too cold. All right. Those are your answers. Punch them in. And pretty soon, there, we've got some results here early here. That's great. Well, 15 said it was uh, 39, but the right answer was the first one, 37.5. And very few of you got it. So that probably separated a lot of people in the, in the, in the front running for the contest. Okay, so let's go to our next one. Let's go right to the next one. Here we go. The key verse from Pastor Steve, that's me, his message last week about, about offering my time was Romans 12, 4 to 6. Colossians 3.17, Acts 2.44-47, 2, and Psalm 121.1-12. These are the kind of harder questions that separate the, you know, the winners from the not the winners. I don't want to say what they're called, but, you know, okay, so these are the ones. So red triangle, Romans 12.4-6, the blue diamond is Colossians 3.17, the yellow circle is Acts 2.44-47, and the green square is Psalm 121.1-2. Okay, do we got our results? I think we do. Okay, it looks like Colossians 3.17 was the most chosen one, and it's the right one. Hey, good job. And uh, now let's go to our next question. Here we go. Oh, did we get to the end already? Ah, that's awesome. No, we didn't get to the end. Okay, here we go. I believe everything I am and everything I own belongs to God is from what chapter? Chapter in the Believe book. We're going through the Believe series. Is it from the, the chapter on single-mindedness? That's the red triangle. The blue diamond is stewardship. The yellow circle is identity in Christ. And the green square is total surrender. Which chapter in the Believe book 
do we have this statement, I believe everything I am and everything I own belong to God. Was it single-mindedness, the red one, the blue one, stewardship, the yellow one, identity in Christ, or the green one, total surrender? Oh, it's get, they get tricky as you go in. I, I don't know if this is a tricky one for you, but it might be. So what's the right answer? Okay, well, we had lots of people pick the right answer, and we had the, it was a real toss-up between a couple of them. Okay, here we go. Here's the final that one, by the way, was stewardship. Here's the finals, uh, top three people. So in third place, we have Cute Glider. In second place, we have Decisive Bear. Good job. And number one is the Mighty Impala. So congratulations, Mighty Impala. You won. And uh, thanks, everybody, for playing as we review things with our Kahoot quiz today. Well, this morning, it's my privilege to uh, talk about our Believe topic number 19. 19. We did 10 weeks where we talked about what Christians believe, and now we're in the next 10 weeks and almost finished. What do Christians practice? What do Christians do? And today it's about giving my resources. Here's the big, here's the question. Here's the question. Let me, let me just throw out the question for the week. It says, how do I best use my resources to serve God and others? And the answer sounds very similar. I give my resources to fulfill God's purposes. And here's our key verse for this week, 2 Corinthians 8, 7. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. So this is the Apostle Paul. He's, he's writing to people who lived in Corinth, the, the Christians that are there, and he's saying, you already are doing excellent in so many areas. It's a great list. Their faith is excellent. Their speech, their, speech, their, their knowledge, their understanding, their, their, their earnestness, the love that they have for each other and for others. Amazing. These are, they're excellent in all these ways. But he says, you already have all these excellent attributes. He says, but see that you excel also in this new one. Now, I love that he uses the word kindled. Kindled. Now, I mean, you might be thinking of Kindle as an as e-reader, but Kindling is small pieces that you use to start a small fire that turns into a big fire. And so these, all of these other areas were kindled in them. As they were taught the way of Jesus, how to, how to follow Jesus, and what Jesus was like, his example, and how he, he um, when they were taught all these things, these things started showing up in their lives in greater, greater measure. But he's writing to them and saying, there's an area I want to kindle in you today. There's something I want to start a fire in you or under you today, and that's in giving, and that's excelling in giving. I want to start a big, big fire in this area in your life. I want to kindle it in you. And um, if you want to excel in the grace of giving, a passion for giving for God's purposes has to be kindled in you. It has to be kindled in you. For many people, giving is an obligation, not a passion. They, may, they know how to give by discipline. Or they know they ought to give, maybe. And they haven't, you know, but it doesn't translate very well because knowing you ought to give and giving easily is quite a different thing. It's quite a different thing. It's, for many people, it's an obligation, but it's not a passion. Um, now, I told you my story. When we were in the week of stewardship, everything I am and everything I own, it all belongs to God. When we were in that week of teaching, I told my story of how my parents uh, taught me a discipline. They taught me the discipline of tithing. That was giving 10% of my income to God, to, towards God's purposes. And they taught me when I was a kid, with dimes, when I made a dollar, they'd give me 10, and then they'd tell me the first one belongs to God. And so I learned how to do that when I was a child. And it was painful when I was a child, but then after a couple of years, I come, came to see that that dime was signifying my loyalty to God. It was sort of like, oh, this is my allegiance to God. This is what I do. I, I belong to him. All of me belongs to him. I'm just showing that with this dime. Okay, so a couple years in, I, I, fig I, I figured out how to get over my, you know, my hang-ups about it, and I started doing it. And then it's the discipline I've practiced my whole life since then. And uh, I shared with you a little bit about the, one of the discoveries I had in, the, in this last year or two was there's a... Um, 
a big study that was done out of some of the uh, Ontario universities, I think McGill and maybe U of T participated in this, and they, they uh, did this project called the HALO Project. And they said, what economic, economic good do churches do? And when they studied all the services that churches provide in communities and then uh, tried to figure it out, they came up with a um, mathematical formula. They said for every dollar that's voluntarily given into a church's budget, it does $4.77 worth of good economically in the community. We're not talking even spiritual good. We're just talking about economic good in the community. So uh, when I read that, I was sort of like excited because this Discipline my parents had taught me, which was to give the first dime out of every 10 to God, had meant that I'd given, well, except for those first couple years when I was a kid, which didn't amount to too much money, but I'd given for the rest of my life 10% of my income. Then to find out that that economically has had the impact of not 10% of my income, but 47.7% of my income. Imagine giving away 40. 47.7% of your income. Wow. Now, I didn't give that much away, but it's had that kind of impact economically. Now, I wasn't giving it so it would have an economic impact. I was giving it as to honor God. Right? I, in fact, someone along the way told me, don't ever give to a church, Steve. And I said, well, why? I've always given to, to church. That's what I do. And they said, no, no. I mean, you might give to church, but give to God. Give to God. And that helped me. Right? Because sometimes if you give to church, sometimes then you think, oh, I want a little bit of strings attached to that giving, right? Well, I'm going to give, but, you know, things better go my way. But no, if you're giving to God, just as an act of worship to him, you, you don't have that happen as much, right? So I, someone taught me that along the way. But the discipline of giving can get you started. And that's what my parents did to me. It was a real gift to teach me uh, when I was young and when I was just dealing with dimes uh, how to give to God so that when I was dealing with dollars or tens of dollars or hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars, I could still do it. And it generally has been a pretty pain-free experience other than those first couple years when I was a kid. And it was, you know, bubble gum or the dime, you know. That was agonizing. But I learned with little, so now it's easier with much. But I don't think that's the end point. Some people would say, well, I, I tithe, I practice tithing. I practice giving a tenth income. I don't think it's the end point. I think excelling in giving, excelling, being excellent at this, is, is where God is wanting people to go. So the generosity is in you. It goes through you. And I, I think of some of the examples we read in our Believe series, like there's a reading plan we're reading through, and we read about uh, people who excelled in giving. Uh, the Old Testament examples of when they were going to build the tabernacle, which was sort of like a, a mobile temple. It wasn't a temple, but it was something they could pick up and move while the people of Israel were moving from Egypt to where they live now in the land of Israel. And, and as they were, they were going to build that, they had, God said, well, you know, everybody who's willing can just give towards this project. And the people were so willing. They were giving gold. They were giving jewels. They were giving uh, all sorts of things to build stuff. They were so willing that they just had more than enough. And they had to say, no, 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 stop giving. In fact, it was the guys who were building the temple who were saying, we've got too much building materials. We've got too much, uh, you know, gold and jewels and all these things. Tell the people to stop giving. Well, the people were loving giving to this project for the purpose of God. Same thing when they built the actual physical temple in Israel. Not, not a movable tent temple, but now a real live structural foundation. People were giving iron. People were giving, uh, you know, all sorts of precious gems and, and all these resources. And they had the same sort of scenario. It was like David at the end of his said, he's praying to God and he said, who are we to give like this? This is amazing. God, it's because you've given to us. And so people, the people have embodied this in the scripture, right? People have embodied this. In the New Testament, when the believers were just getting started and they were just sort of this small band, uh, growing band of followers of Jesus, um, there was a guy named Barnabas, and he did what many did at that point. He realized there were lots of needs in this community of, of, of new Christians. And so he said, I'm going to take this property I have, I'm going to sell it, I'm going to give it to the leaders in the church, and they're going to distribute it as they see fit to meet the needs in the community. And it says that there were many who did that, not just Barnabas, but others who did that as well. Wow, radical. Radical giving. And let me tell you a story from my life. Um, I was traveling, after I, I went to three, three years, I went to Bible college, and then after that, I, I joined a, 
a traveling group called Life Force, and they did drama stuff all over Western Canada. The team I went, went all over Western Canada. So you'd be in high schools doing, uh, you know, positive life presentations, or you'd be in churches, you know, doing gospel presentations. But anyhow, we were in Kindersley, Saskatchewan, which isn't that far from here, and we were in Kindersley, Saskatchewan, and we were uh, going to do a presentation, and we were, uh, you know, putting up our lights and all of our, you know, our, our sets and stuff like that, and we're taping down all the cords so no one would trip on them in the drama performance, and we ran out of duct tape. And so we told one of the guys on the team, Glenn, Glenn, go get us duct tape. Go find whatever hardware stores there are in Kindersley and buy all the duct tape because we need duct tape. And so we're just like, Glenn, go, go, go. We, we're, performance is starting. We have very, very little time. Go. You've got to go and get back, and we've got to tape these down, and we've got to... So Glenn, under a great rush, got into his car, raced off, and, and a little while later, it took him a little longer than we thought. He came back, and we're like, oh, it took you a while. Why did it take you so long? And then he showed us his speeding ticket. We're like, oh. And he's like, oh. And we were, most of us were quite poor students. I remember um, I would, sometimes we'd go out, you know, for a night. We'd go out to some place to eat. And often I would just, you know, the wait, waiter or waitress would come around, and I'd say, yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm not, I'm not eating tonight. But the reality was I had very little money at that time. I'd been three, three years of college. And, you know, after three years of college, you often have very little money. So I had very little money, and, and several on the team were like that. Some were more well off. But what happened was, here's Glenn. He's got this big speeding ticket. And we all feel somewhat responsible because we were the ones pressuring him, go fast, go fast. And now he's here standing with his speeding ticket. We know he can't pay it. And so then one of our guys on our team, he just, he's a musician, he just jumped over to the piano and just started playing. Do -do -do -do. Lindsay started playing. And he started, he said, brothers and sisters, we have a brother in the house who's in need. And then Esther Hooper, my friend, she jumps up to the microphone and she just said, oh, we're going to take up an offering for this poor soul, you know. And everybody just starts having fun with this. And then a couple of us grab, like we're in a, we're in a, uh, a setting where we can have, and so we just started having fun and, and passing around like a, something to collect money in it. And, you know, we passed it around once, and we're like, 20 bucks, that's not going to pay a $180 ticket. Keep going. And so we kept sending it around and having fun and goofing off. And, and then by the time we were done, all us poor uh, college students had managed to pay the ticket. And it was so much fun. It was so much fun. We just had such a good time with it. It was just fun to give. Have you found giving fun? I mean, is it a joy for you? Is it a natural, or is it still a not to, an obligation, maybe a discipline? But has it become something that you love to do? 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each of you should give what, he, what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. That means someone's twisting your arm. For God loves a cheerful giver. That's God's desire for us, is to get to that point where giving is cheerful. Acts 20, 35 says, In everything I did, I showed you that, again, um, let me get to the end of it. He just basically says, oh, In everything I did, I showed you by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Have you ever heard that statement before? Yeah, maybe it was your parents saying, you know, you're, you're upset at Christmas or something. <laughs> it's more blessed to give than receive. And so maybe that's how you still hear it in your head. And you think, obligation, 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 right? I should be happy to give. But maybe you hear it differently. And maybe, I think God wants you to hear it differently. I want that to be, for that to become real and, and powerful within you, that you actually say, no, I've experienced this. It is way more blessed to give than receive. I love giving. And I don't, this has happened in me over the course of time. And even if it hasn't happened and that doesn't resonate with you yet, I think that's where God wants to lead you in the future. So giving is not a have to, but a get to. It may start out as a have to. And I'm not saying a lot of good isn't done by those who are obligated or feel they ought to. I think lots of good. I mean, I think of my practice of tithing that I practice all my life. I think it's done a lot of good. But I think there's more. There's more in living a generous life. So it may start out as a have to, but God wants it to become a get to in our lives. How does it happen? Matthew uh, 6, 19 to 21 talks about, um, well, let me read it. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. 
But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermins do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So giving is a heart matter. Giving is a heart matter. Now there's basically two types of people when it comes uh, to money. I mean, you could probably make it, I'm going to make it simple. They're savers and they're spenders, okay? So how many in the room, and, and online you can raise your hand too just so you're included, okay? How many in the room you say, I'm a saver? I know that. That's the way I lean. I tilt that way. I might be right close to 50% or I might be way into that. But I, Okay, how many of you say, I'm a spender? I tilt a little bit more the other way, okay? And I've already noticed that some of you are married to somebody who's the opposite to you. That's fun. All right, and so this is what I want you to do. If you're a saver and you're sitting with a spender, I'd like you to turn to them right now. You can do this at home as well. Just turn to them right now, and this is what I want you to just repeat after me. This will help you to say this again and again in your life. You can just repeat this the rest of your life. I want you to say, I am a saver. Let's try that again. I am a saver so you can be a spender. <laughs> Oh, doesn't that feel good, savers? Does it feel good? Don't you feel self-righteous? Ah, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I'm, I'm a little bit on the saver side, so this is something I might say. Okay, uh, but if you're a spender, okay, I'm going to give you something to say, too. If you're a spender sitting with a saver, this is what I want you to say. I am a spender so you can have a life. <laughs> All right. <laughs> And maybe you don't know if you're a saver or a spender. Maybe, you're, maybe you feel like you're both. Maybe you're saying, I like to save my money and spend other people's money. So what does that make me? Well, there's nothing wrong with being a saver or a spender. But when they're taken to an extreme, they start to get problematic. So savers, when, they're ta when they take saving to an extreme, they become misers. Okay. And spenders, when they take it to an extreme, they become materialistic. And there's a problem because they're both about me. Misers and materialists are both about me. Now, how does it work, though? I, for a miser, for a miser, money is about security. Money is about security. Let me just read to you what it sounds like to hang out with a miser. This is Proverbs 23, 6 to 7. This describes hanging out with a miser. It says, do not eat the food of a begrudging host. Do not crave his delicacies. For he's the kind of person who's always thinking about the cost. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. So the miser knows that giving is the right thing to do, but his heart's not there. There's a competing belief in the miser's heart that is stronger than the urge to give. There's a story Jesus tells in the New Testament about a man who's got, he's, he's had a great crop and he's lying back in bed and thinking, what should I do now? I'm going to build bigger barns and have more crops and get so much, in fact, so much that in my later years of life, I can just coast and take it easy. And God rebukes him in a quite a startling way and, and rebukes him. And one of the end lines of it is, is uh, this is the kind of rebuke that's given to a person who's not rich towards God. So the miser thinks like this. He thinks like, what's the ultimate? I want security. Now, security, wanting security is actually probably not a bad desire. It's a very natural desire. But for the miser, they say, that security, I believe, is best found in money. It's best found in money and not God. Now let's talk about the other side because I don't want all the savers in the room to feel like, oh man, this is a downer, this sermon. Well, it's going to be a downer for both. Equal opportunity downing today. Here we go. For the materialist, money is about status. It's about status. Let me read you Psalm 73, verse 3. It says, For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So the writer of this psalm or song is, is admitting something. They saw what other people had and they wanted what the other person had. Status is, is often about visible riches. Visible riches. What you wear. What you drive. Your toy collection. 
And adults have toy collections too, don't we know? Where you live, where you vacation, who your peers are, what's your family status? So for the materialist, money is about status. And for the miser, uh, money is about security. And 1 Timothy 6, 5 to 8 has a very interesting um, warning in it. And I just want to read this to you. It says, um, it's talking about people who have, in verse 5, who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. So some people might have this thought. They say, if I serve God, if I do what is right, maybe if I lead in the church or something like that, it will lead to financial gain for me. And here's the counterpoint, verse 6. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. You want gain? It's not, financial gain is not the greatest gain. Because you can have, you can be rich and discontented. In fact, that's a common, a common thing that people experience. I want more. I've got, if I, had, I thought if I got this, I'd be satisfied, but now I want this, and now I just need this, and now I just need this. And that's the same for the saver who's trying to accumulate different numbers in their bank account or their investments, and it's the same for the spender who thought that this product or this thing that signals status would, would be enough, but now here's something else that signals status, and they want that too. So God is always inviting us to move away from a me focus to a God focus. Let me read you the rest of that in 1 Timothy. Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we could take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Ooh, that's quite a statement. Can you say it with great conviction? If I have food and clothing, I'll be content with that. How do we get there? So I'm talking about realities. You might not be experiencing this in your heart. You're saying, that's not in my heart. You say it's a matter of the heart. How do I change my heart? Well, it, it starts with belief. We've been talking about belief, right? In chapter 1 and 2, we talked about how there's, uh, the God of the Bible is the one and only true God. And then in chapter 2 of the belief series, we talked about that he is involved in and cares about our lives. Those are foundational. He's, he's, he's real. He's the real deal. He's the tr one and only true God. And he's involved in and cares about my life. And if that's true, then there's a whole bunch of other things that follow. Right? Chapter 3, we talked about, um, we talked about the security we ha can have in relationship with God. How Jesus is, has made it possible for us to uh, be forgiven of our sins, have the leadership of God in our lives, to have our eternity secure. We want security. I mean, Money might, you know, we look to it to give us some security in this life. But what about the life to come? God, through Jesus, has made it possible for us to have security in the life to come. And, and, and that's real security. Chapter 5, we talked about identity in Christ. We talked about our identity in Christ. Do you believe that your greatest identity is in, is in being a son or daughter of God? That he's given you a status that's as high as you could ever obtain? And it's a status you couldn't even attain on your own, but he has made it possible. So is your security, savers, who are tempted to be misers, is your security in God? And spenders who might be tempted to be materialists, is your status in your relationship with God and your identity as a child of God? This is where the game changes. This is where the heart changes. The heart is, a, is, a, is basically a, it's a collection point for what you believe. And it's in those beliefs. It's in knowing what God can do for us. And so instead of looking to money as the source of security and as the source of status, we look to God. Matthew 6, 24 tells us that this is a war inside of our heart. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve, and what does he say? Both, does anyone know? God and money. There's a battle for your heart. The heart is the residence of your beliefs, and it'll determine 
who you become and how you behave. So the struggle between God and money is real, and only one of those can be your ultimate source. Jesus says they both can't be ultimate. You're going you're gonna to have to choose to serve one or the other. And now what happens is when you choose to serve one or the other, you're going to then tell one or the other to be subservient to the other. So if you choose to serve money, you're, you're going you're to try to make God serve money. That doesn't work. God will not serve our idols. It just doesn't work. He, you can't make God do that. But you might try. You might say, Godly, godliness, I think it's a means to financial gain. I think it's a means to become rich. The other way it works, though. When you use money to serve God, it actually works. It works. But one's going to be ultimate in our lives and and the other one's going to be subservient, at least in our minds. God, of course, will never be subservient. But we may think it that way. 1 Timothy 6, 9 to 10 says those, it, it's got, it, it, 1 Timothy's got great, it's got stuff for those who want to get rich and those who are already rich. I don't know which one you think you are. If you are a North American, so probably you're already rich compared to the globe, you know? That's probably true. But, we still want to get rich, even if we're in the richest percentages of the world's population, we still want to get richer, don't we? That's part of it. So this is probably applies to us both. Both these passages probably apply. But first, our desire to get rich. Those who want to get rich, 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So it's a great big warning about the love of money for those who want to get rich. Now, what about the other one? For those who are rich, 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19. It says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant. What's that again? That's status nor to put their hope in wealth. What's that? That sounds like security, doesn't it? Which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they'll lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold, oh, get this line, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. See, why does God want me to give? Well, lots of good reasons, but here's one that I think is awesome. So that you could take hold of the life that's really life until you've until you've come to this place where you're starting to grow in generosity and you're starting to, to like it and you're becoming a cheerful giver and it's, and it's becoming something that you really, really enjoy and you want to invest in what God's doing in the world, you're not really living. There's a whole bunch of life left to experience. When my wife and I got married, I'm a very... Uh, again, I said I'm, I'm on the saver side. I'm a fair ways on the saver side. Miserliness is beckoning all the time to me. I'm always tempted in that regard. So when I got married, my wife discovered my finances were regimented. I give this, I give this, I give this. That's what I give. Do you ever give spontaneously? Why would anyone give spontaneously? This is the way it is done. <laughs> Now, she's a more spontaneous giver. So she'd say, I just get my heart moved about a cause. I hear something in church. I want to give. We were not the same. So we, we, I said, I can't live like you. I can't do that. And she's like, well, I can't do, you know, what you do. So what's the compromise? So this is what we came up with. He said, well, we're still going to have set budgeted amounts that we give, and they're just automatic. They come out of the bank, and they go right to the cause, and we're still going to have some of those. But we'll allocate some portion of our, our income to spontaneous giving. And I said, it can't be too spontaneous because it can't handle it. <laughs> so I said, it actually has to be a set amount, 
But who it goes to, that can be spontaneous. So, you know, really, she was accommodating me more than I was accommodating her. But anyhow, so we would have once a month, we would take this amount that was a percentage of our income together, and we would take that, and we would, we would deliver, we'd have what we call a giving party. We'd say, who are we giving to this month? So maybe it was a friend who had a need or, or someone we just wanted to bless or something. But it was fun. Even a curmudgeon like myself found it fun. It was fun. It was like, who are we going to give? Well, I've been thinking it should be this. Person. I've been thinking this. And we make a list. And then we, we talk about it. We pray about it. And then we say, we, we come to an agreement. We say, let's give to this person. Oh, this is going to be so much fun. It's just sort of something we look forward to every month. Who are we going to give to this month? This is fun. I mean... My regimented heart was growing a little bit. <laughs> God wants you to take hold of life that is truly life. And it's through, in this case, it's through giving. It's through giving. Now I want to just end with this. 2 Corinthians 6, or I mean 8, is, the, is what uh, Matt was reading as our scripture for today. I want to just read the first seven verses again to you and just point out a couple things. Because the example Paul gives is he says, I want you to be like this one church. They got it. And uh, I hope that as our, our church, that we, we get it like this. So let me just read it to you. It says, brothers and sisters, I want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Man, it's a grace to be able to give. It's like God sees our hearts that are so wound up in the need for security that money can provide or we think can provide or the need for status that money can provide or we think that can provide. But he wants to just pour just that oil of grace all over that rigid area in our lives where our hope is in wealth and really not in God. And he wants to just change that. He wants to do a heart work. And he did that in the Macedonian church. I want to tell you about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches in the midst of a very severe trial and this was uh, the people in Jerusalem. There was uh, persecution and also famines. The different things that happened there. They, there was a need for money. It says their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Now, if you say ex oh, joy plus extreme poverty, that doesn't result in ge rich generosity. In this case, it did because God was in work in them. It says, for I testify, they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. This was serious sacrificial giving. This was serious sacrificial giving that they did. And how did it come to this? Did Paul twist their arm? Did he, did he manipulate them? Did he stir them up with an inspiring speech and got them to give? No, he says, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. They were twisting Paul's arm. They, Paul's like, hey, you guys don't have anything. No, 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 no. We want a part of this. We want a piece of the action. We want to live the life that's truly life. Let us bless our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. So they gave, and then, and then oh, I think this is so key. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord. And then by the will of God also to us. Here's the thing. Um, if you're in a church and it's offering time, I mean, and, you know, most churches have some sort of way that, you know, maybe they pass the plate or collect this stuff. You know, the most important thing you can offer to God is yourself. I think offering time, and we're not doing that so much now. It's a lot of it's online and we're doing things different in COVID season. But I just think the offering that's most important is to offer yourself to God. Romans, uh, Romans 12, isn't it? As a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto God. Just say, God, Offer you me, all that I am, all that I have. It belongs to you. God, you didn't, you didn't spare your own son. You gave Jesus to live the perfect life, to die a sacrificial life, a death on my behalf, to take my sins and the blame for it all on himself, to take away my guilt, to wash me clean from my sin to, so it's all forgiven and so that I have a righteous standing before God. You've done all these things in my life. If you've done that, i got to trust you that you're going to do all, you're going to give me all the things I need in this life. And you know what? Now I don't need the security of money like I once did. Now I don't need the status of money and that siren song for something more that will elevate that. 
I have security in you. I have status in you. I'm a child of God who knows that my forever is dealt with, who knows that I'm safe in your hand, who knows that you're a better provider than I could ever be. When that starts to sink in, when that starts to work into our heart, then we find that release to give, to be open-hearted and open-handed. They gave themselves first to the Lord and also to us. So we er and then let me skip to our key verse again. But since you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and complete earnestness and the love we've kindled in you, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. Just closing right now. But you know what I want to say as a, to you as a church, Hillcrest Church, I love preaching these ones where I, I feel like there's so much to commend. I, we, we are, I'm not preaching this sermon because the church is in the red and we're in dire need. We're in the black. We ended the year with more than enough and we had a good start to the first year. I mean, we're in a good position and this church is full of generous givers. There's lots of people. You know what? I, I am indebted to other pastors who went before me that taught you well. Somebody taught you along the way to give to the Lord. And so, I don't, I love it when it's like, I'm just doing maintenance here. There's not a big corrective here. There's not a big, but, but the thing is for you to really listen to the Lord on this one. Listen to the Lord. Maybe you've never, maybe some of you who are listening to, you've never really given towards God's work. And if that's the case, I'd say just start. Start. You say, I, I couldn't possibly reallocate 10% of my, my uh, you know, I couldn't do what you described doing because you got it easy. You started with dimes. I get it. I get it. It's harder later. But start somewhere. I mean, God wants to take you on a path of journey and giving so that you live that life that really is life. You live that life where you're like, I am so, my heart, like, where your treasure is, there your heart is. Here's one thing I've discovered. The more I give, the more my heart gets invested. I, I find it's funny. My money follows my heart, and my heart follows my money. If I start giving towards, like if someone says, I'm going to go on a mission trip, or I'm going, to go, I'm going to go do this kind of thing, and I put some money towards that, even if it's a small amount, I'm really interested in the results. I'm engaged with that. I, I, sometimes I'm more, I'm more likely to pray for those people. I'm more likely to ask how it went. I'm more likely to, why? Because my money and, my, and, and heart, they get, they get attached. And if you haven't experienced the joy of radical giving, then st start. Start. And I would say the starting place is where they did. Offer yourself to God. Say, God, I, I need that truth that all that I am that stewardship truth. All that I am, all that I have belongs to you. I need that in my life. I need that to go deeper into my heart. I need it to be a softening effect in my heart. To free up my fingers. <laughs> to free up my life to give. Will you stand with me here in the house? And let's pray together. Thank you, Father, that the answer for both savers and spenders who are tempted to be misers and materialists is the same. It's putting our hope in you. Putting our hope in you. And you're the best source of security that a person could have. Money can be gone in a moment. But we know that you are an unshakable foundation for our lives. You're like the rock of Gibraltar in, in, or the rock, um, Ayers Rock, that's right, in, in Australia. Just a massive, unmovable foundation that we can build on. So we want, Lord, when our heart is, is, is angsty about security in our lives, I pray that you'd show us again and again how you are our security. You're the one we can, we can depend on. You're the one we can look to. And Lord, when, we're, when, it's, when it's status, that's a siren song that's, that's drawing us. 
saying, if you have this, you'll be happy. If you have this, you'll look better. You'll, you'll, uh, you'll be welcome into select gatherings. Lord, help us to recognize we've already been welcomed into the most prestigious, wonderful relationship you could ever be, and that's being your child. So, Lord, I pray that that identity that we have in you would become more and more um, potent all the time. So, Lord, deliver us from greed. Deliver us from envy. Deliver us about uh, controlling fear over finances. I believe that some people right now that they're recognizing there's a grip on their heart that this area has for them. And Lord, I ask that they be set free from that. I ask that you would, you would uh, 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 um, assure them that you got this, that you're with them, that money doesn't need to be our master. It's a bad master anyhow. It's an enslaving master. And so, Lord, I pray you'd, you'd break those chains of bondage in this area off people's minds and hearts this morning, that they'd be set free to live the life that's really life. We ask all those things in your name, Jesus. You can do the miracles in our hearts that we need. And so we, we pray in your name. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.